Honourable Damien O'Connor. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. And, and uh, I, I do kind of feel sorry for the high country farmers who I know will be following this debate very, very carefully. And unfortunately, the criticism that might come from this side of this House is not of them individually at all, but it is of a situation that the National Party is creating here. And I don't think any one of those proud people would, be want, would want to think that they are getting a subsidy or special favour or cap in hand, as the previous speaker said. Well, in fact, the cap in hand approach is exactly what has happened here because there have been claims that you know, the new rents would be unaffordable. Those, that, that is, the new rents, those are ones calculated on what would normally be seen as a fair commercial basis. A fair commercial basis on the valuation of the land and at a percentage that the market generally accepts at around 4 or 5%. Now, we know for some of those properties, and we acknowledge it in government, that that was a huge increase. And it was going to create a big cost and post on the farmers. And we committed as a Labor Party to work through those situations. But what we've got here, and, and unfortunately, the high country people will have to listen to this argument for quite some time, because it is an income-based rental that every lessee in this country would love to have. In fact, I apologise for being late in the House, because I was meeting with people um, around the kiwifruit industry. Why wouldn't those growers love to have an income-based rental on their properties that they're leasing? Why wouldn't they? And, and we could go back and read from Hansards the vitriolic criticism of us when we tried to implement income-based rentals for people who wanted to have a home. So while I apologise to the high country farmers for being drawn into this debate, and all the words that will go backwards and forwards, the fact is, and I've said this up front to them, I support them absolutely. They are a special breed of people who are prepared to live in isolated uh, situations, um, commit to hard work in harsh environments. And not many New Zealanders want to do that these days. But there are many New Zealanders in hard times, facing big challenges, and many would like a break whether it be an income-based rental or some other form of support. But what we're doing here, and when you compare the bill to conventions across all legislation that we pass in this House, what we're doing here is setting up something that won't hold water when you compare it to a lot of other things. And if we are going to go down the path of income-based rentals, and as I say, we, we, we committed to that in housing, basic area of need. We might end up having to look at that in the area of water charging for domestic supply for a start. People can't afford it. And maybe, you know, some of the agricultural sector will be back before us here saying we can't afford for the water to run our stock or irrigation. Who knows? Under a, under a ridiculous market-based scenario that, that I'm sure this national government will want to put in place around water, the value of it could get to unaffordable levels for people who want basic water. And they may come back with a request for, just like the high country situation, for an income-based rental because we can't afford it. Now, there might be an argument, and with this passage of this bill, there will be a precedent. And so I expect now that that parliament will be bombarded with requests in relation to government responsibility where income-based levies or income-based taxes or income-based charges will be requested. And it's a perfectly reasonable request given that we are putting this piece of legislation in place. Mr Speaker, on part one of the bill, there are, interp there are interpretations and, and definitions here. Um, and some of them are, are really difficult. Base carrying capacity. That's the... the the, the number of stock that you can carry on a bit of land. Of course, it's supposed to be a bit of land that was there before 
any Māori or European came to the land. Unimproved land value, land exclusive of improvements. Well, I don't know how we're going to calculate that, I have to say, Mr. S Mr. Chairman. Honourable Damien O'Connor. I don't know how we're going to calculate that. And part 1A there, you know, goes through this complex system of trying to redefine land exclusive, exclusive of improvements. When the valuation system had moved beyond that to basically a position of market value. And in the Māori Reserve Land Bill, now Act, we'd shifted from unimproved land value to effectively market value to give the Māori landowners fair return on their assets. And I think that was a reasonable outcome. It's caused a lot of angst and pain for many homeowners. And, and I think, you know, the, the lessors needed to take a, a kind approach, and they have done in some cases, not in others. Point being, valuation had shifted from unimproved land value to one of market value, and we're turning that on its ear once again. So trying to define what was the base carrying capacity, how many sheep could that land have held in the year 1650? Because if we led to believe not much changed before we came along, as I'm sure the Green Party will advocate, then, then I guess the number of sheep that that property could carry in 1650 would be the base carrying capacity. And then we move forward to the current carrying capacity of the land. And then factor to incorporate 0 0.1.5 of the difference between those two capacities. It's a nightmare, quite frankly, a mathematical nightmare that then incorporates, as defined in part one and 1A, a dollar per stock unit value. Well, the member over there with a big smile on his face there, the, 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 the ex-member of Meat, Meat and Wool Board there, he would know that those values vary quite a lot between different stock type um, and between different years of, of production for a whole lot of reasons. Bizarre, most of them, but anyway, um, usually on, on, on what the meat company might want to pay. Point being that there's huge variability in this and we're trying to, well, the government is attempting to put in place a sound and steady and reliable system of calculating lease payments that, in my view, is basically flawed, totally, absolutely flawed. And what Labor had done in government was realise that values of the land had, had gone up. If we were to maintain consistency through valuation, yes, the lease payments went up, we said where they clearly are ridiculous or unaffordable, then we need to sit down and work through that. But shifting the precedent of land valuation and shifting the precedent of lease calculation is a very dangerous move. And while members over there might say this is a very special case, uh, and it is a unique land, I, I accept that. Unfortunately, most people on leasehold properties will all consider that they have special cases. The Zespri kiwi fruit growers being those people at the moment who are facing huge problems and challenges and I'm sure would like a break so that they could have affordable lease arrangements. This is not good law. That's why there's going to be robust debate. I do support and Labor supports the ongoing wise management of the high country. This is not necessarily going to help in moving in that direction. Um, Shane Arden. Mr Chairman, it's always a privilege and a pleasure to follow along from the member from West Coast Tasman. Uh, but I need to back up a little bit and just uh, uh, recap, I guess, some...